Beloved, I pray that all is well in your household and that everyone is safe and at peace. We continue to pray for all those who are affected by this virus and all the medical responders that are on the front lines and all that our leaders are doing in order to create a far safer place in the midst of this pandemic. And so we want to keep them all in our prayers. Certainly, we want to keep in prayer as well all those that you know that are suffering and that are dealing with issues related to the virus. I want to read to you a portion of Matthew 27, a very small portion, as the reading for this week is obviously very lengthy in Matthew 27 because Palm Sunday is Sunday and we are now entering into Passion Week. The fact that we're entering into Passion Week and the passage that I've chosen I think are significant in light of where we are. It says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lema shavach dani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's from Psalm 22. And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. One of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Jesus cried in again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened and many of the saints, many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Matthew writes his gospel to make us very aware that the cross and the crucified Christ are essential to understanding the gospel. There is no gospel without a cross. There are those that would tell us that the bloody cross has no place. And yet, if you carefully read the scriptures, you discover that the cross is central to the gospel. And there are many popular teachers very well respected that, that contend that the cross is not necessary. There are some Franciscan, contemporary Franciscans that argue that there's no need for a bloody cross. I vehemently disagree with that. The crucified Christ is at the very core of what the heart of the Father is revealing about his undying love for us when he dies. Christ assumes our place and cries out as if he were us in order to bring us into communion by the Spirit with his Father. And it's interesting to me that Psalm 22 begins with the perplexing question of, my God, my God, why? And it was a psalm of the exiles. And we need to understand that this is not a psalm that was unfamiliar to faithful Jews. This was a psalm that was well known and chanted often by the Jews as they came out of Babylon and back to the land during Second Temple Judaism. You've got to remember that when they came out of Babylon to rebuild the temple and expected the latter glory to be greater than the former glory, they didn't see it in their day. Ultimately, it pointed to Christ. But when they came back, they were still under the rule of other kings. The Babylonian Empire gave way to the Medo-Persian Empire, who 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 were those that ruled over the Jews. And then the Medo-Persian Empire was conquered by the Greek Empire, Alexander the Great, and they ruled over the Jews. And then finally the Greeks were conquered by Rome and and Caesar ruled over the Jews. And so they never were fully free, though they were back in the land. And Jesus, who represents the nation of Israel and intercedes for them, stands in the gap as Israel, cries out on that cross as the exiled community, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, God cannot forsake God. So the whole notion that God forsook Jesus at the cross, I believe is a fundamental error in the way we're reading the text because this, this particular psalm is about the exiles that didn't know that they could ever come home. 
And so it's a, it's a lament. It's a public prophetic lament of feeling as if they were forsaken by God. This is not God abandoning Jesus at the cross. God cannot abandon God. The three persons of the Godhead mutually indwell one another. This is God in Christ reconciling the world to himself by giving the voice to our why in a place where we could not be heard because of our separation from God. Here's the thing we want to understand about the question why. Why is always a question that seems to go unanswered. It's a question that is the most unaffirming question you could ask. It's easier to get an answer for who, how, what, when, and where. But why is generally a question of perplexity, anguish, and often tied to suffering. I think N.T. Wright this week wrote a brilliant article on My God, My God, Why, and some were upset with it because he offers to the nations the fact that the church doesn't have an answer for the pandemic, that my God, my God, why is the answer, that there are just some things that God doesn't answer. And I think there's wisdom there. I think there's a lot of wisdom there and something we need to consider. I'm also reminded of how Walter Brueggemann speaks of this my God, my God, why is essential to the outworking of redemption. And between my God, my God, why and the final cry of Jesus, there are people that misunderstand, there are people that misinterpret, there are people that endeavor to claim he's calling Elijah when he's speaking to God. You would think they would have known he was chanting Psalm 22 from the cross because Psalm 22 opens with, my God, my God, why? And it ends with, it is finished. So when Jesus cries out after, my God, my God, why? It is finished. He has virtually chanted that whole psalm. And when you read through that psalm, you discover there at the cross, he is interceding for the nations. He is securing their place in an eternal destiny where they will become part of the kingdom of God, etc., etc., etc. He's interceding for all humankind, and he is winning the battle, even though he is surrounded by the bulls of Bashan and all the types and shadows of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious systems, the empire, Rome itself. Here is the Christ of glory, the Lord of heaven and earth, the king of new creation, overcoming and disarming principalities and powers through the cross, reconciling the world to himself and being the author and finisher of our faith and that one who ushers in new creation in his very person. And so my God, my God, why is essential if there's going to be and it is finished. And somehow, some way, we need to come to terms with the fact that oftentimes in life, we have to go through seasons where there are no answers. And we have to give voice to lament. We like to sing songs of celebration, but there are a third of the psalms that are psalms of lament. They are prophetic, they are powerful, and they are essential to our worship. And so this psalm of lament is the psalm of the exiles that feel they can never come home. And yet, Jesus endures in that time all that he endures. He becomes sin who knew no sin, etc., etc., etc. And when he cries out again with a loud voice, it is finished. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The only other place other than Matthew twenty-seven fifty-one, where that phrase torn in two from top to bottom is used in the Greek is when Nicodemus is told by Jesus, you must be born from above, anothane. This is top to bottom, anothane, top to bottom, born from above, top to bottom, is a reflection of the reality that only God can save us and only God can move on our lives to bring us to himself. And so not only does the temple, uh, curtain of the temple, the holy, the holy place, the holiest of all, where the veil of the temple is rent from top to bottom, and the, and the veil in Herod's temple, unlike the veil in the tabernacle and in Solomon's temple, was not a thin veil. It was a very thick veil. Some say it was like one of those big, huge telephone, massive yellow pages telephone book thick. It was a huge, heavy veil, and God Almighty ripped it from top to bottom letting us know the way into the holiest of all has been made possible through the shedding of the blood of Christ Jesus himself. 
Not only that, but there are cosmic implications. The temple isn't just affected. Matthew tells us that the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were open. Many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And when the centurion, the Roman centurion, the one who was in charge of the hundred who beat Jesus and then had to set up his crucifixion. Um, and each one of those soldiers took a shot at Jesus and pummeled his face, apart from all the, the other things that they did that were brutalizing and oppressive. But when the centurion, who was in charge of all that, saw all that was happening and saw the earthquake that took place, he cried out, truly, this was the Son of God. So even in that moment, an enemy of Christ becomes a loyal allegiant to the kingdom of heaven through Christ. There can be no it is finished without a my God, my God, why? There are seasons we go through, beloved, we're not going to have the answers. And in a culture that demands answers, in a culture that is so consumer driven that we think we can get any answers we want at the touch of a button, there are things God allows to take place in our lives that defy answers, that defy quick and easy definitions, and that defy any technique will get you through this. No, there are some times where we will cry out, my God, my God, why? And somehow in that lament, in that prophetic cry, in giving voice to that pain, it has a cosmic effect. It shatters things that are solid, rocks split, earth, the earthquakes, and things that are less than God's intent are torn from top to bottom. God determines their end. And then God himself draws us to himself through that cross. Paul says, I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. He tells us in Galatians 2, 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There at the cross, Christ gave himself for you and for me. The why he cries is our why. It is our sense of not having the answers. It is our sense of of being alienated and separated is our sense of being abandoned and forsaken. He is crying for us before the Father because only his voice can turn the tide by his very being and his very actions. He cries out of that act of love in suffering for us, my God, my God, why? And all of heaven pays attention, so much so that the sun grows dark in the middle of the day, the earthquakes, the rocks split, and the tombs of the saints open up, and they wait till Sunday to come out and testify of new creation. You know, it's ironic, one of my professors in college and undergraduate school, my Greek professor, New Testament Greek, assigned us this passage of scripture for our Greek final at the end of the year. We had to parse all the verbs and go through all the uh, the lemma of that. And um, on the day before, he wanted to do a prep with us. And he read out of the Greek Bible and then made the statement after he read that entire passage that I just read. It's a shame Matthew put this in his gospel. Now, mind you, this is a New Testament Greek scholar in the Lutheran church. It's a shame that Matthew put this in the gospel. It has no relevance whatsoever. Now, he was speaking out of a form critical, text critical approach uh, to the Bible that was seeking to demythologize, claiming this didn't happen, that didn't happen. And I was young and zealous in Christ back then. And I said to him, Dr. So-and-so, I said, if you deny that that took place, I doubt the resurrected Christ is anywhere near your life or your existence. To which he got quite angry and said a few choice words and threw his Bible on the floor, walked out and told the entire class, if you all fail tomorrow, it's because of Sharona. 
And um, I still hold to that. I, I, I believe Matthew is telling us the entire story. I don't believe these are just theological insertions to give us a goosebump or to make a point. These things actually happened. And the moment we move from that, I think we move from why the scripture is the scripture. And so the fact is, though, that there can't be and it is finished. I agree with Walter Brueggemann. There can't be and it is finished unless it's preceded by a my God, my God, why? And in that liminal space between my God, my God, why? And it is finished. The reverberation of that groaning, the reverberation of that lament pushes us through that thin threshold of a veil and has cosmic implications to bring us into communion and into abiding through Christ by the Spirit with God the Father. Sunday, Palm Sunday, is going to be a great day in the house. For those of you that can come, we're having drive-in church. We are allowed. We have permission. We have called all the necessary authorities. You're going to stay in your cars. We're going to practice all the necessary things for social distancing. And those of you that have to stay home, the live stream will be available. We're urging everyone to be on. Let's celebrate Holy Week together. Let's do it faithfully. Let's do it uh, in confidence and let's do it with a sense that God is up to something good even in the midst of a my God, my God, why? See you Sunday.